welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 345, live from VidCon 2022, where we interview Monica Scudieri from GrabYourSlice.com and talk about going from six-figure debt as a single parent to financial independence in just 10 short years. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and joining me today is the military guide, Doug Nordman from MilitaryFinancialIndependence.com. Doug, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Mindy. This is always fun. This is always fun. It's always lovely to see you, Doug. Thank you. Doug and I are here to make financial independence less scary, <laughs> less just for somebody else. To introduce you to every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you are starting. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world or want to make big time investments in assets like real estate or start your own business, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards your dreams and freedom. And freedom. Oh, and freedom. I love that little addition, Doug. Yep, yep. Doug is joining me today because Scott is not at FinCon. He's off um, gallivanting. Should we call him lazy? He's just... <laughs> <laughs> He's Scott the unlaziest is... person I know. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Scott is wonderful. I am the president of his fan club. I am just talking smack. Doug is stepping into Doug's uh, to Scott's shoes. <laughs> Because Doug knows Monica, and Monica has recently written a book called Grab Your Slice of Financial Independence, where she tells her story of being in six-figure debt as a single parent, all the way to financial independence in 10 short years. And I have to tell you, if a single parent in six-figure debt can become financially independent in 10 years, you can too. I don't care what your situation is you can become financially independent too. So Monica Scudieri, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Let's jump right in because FinCon has a very tight time schedule for recording. <laughs> Where does your journey with money begin? So my journey uh, actually began when I went through my divorce and um, we went through the divorce. Um, I, I, we had, the kids were really young. Uh, I took on the debt of the marriage, the $257,000 of debt. And yes, and I um, went through, t in the first five years, it was actually really hard because I had a temp job that ended. Um, I was on unemployment actually for 22 months because I lost three jo three temp jobs in the first five years. Not, not due to her own misconduct. No, no, it's just, you know, the economy, I was, it was temp work. And, and when you're a single parent, you're limited to, you can't drive very far to a job. You have to be nine to five because you have before and after school care. Um, you can't do overtime. And so all of those limitations really kind of put me in a wedge of these are the certain jobs I can take. So if they wanted weekend work, night work, these are things that I could not accommodate when you have small children. Um, so, but, you know, so the first five years were really hard, but I kept my why with my kids, um, to reach that financial independence. I've never wanted to rely on a paycheck or child support or anything. Um, and so I just kept that in my for forefront of my mind. And then there was an opportunity after those five years to sell the house and downsize. And then I was able to pay off the debt and put money down on my house. I was able to, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but I was able to use a HELOC off of my personal home to be able to put money down to buy my first rental property. And then from there, I was able to buy two more. And then the next year I bought two more. And between that and putting money in 401k and some Roth and HSA and a bunch of other things, um, I realized at the end of 10 years that I became financially independent and that I could quit my job. And that in and of itself was, it was a lot to take in. So I didn't quit my job right away because it, first of all, it was disbelief that I could do that. And so I took some time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do and the direction. COVID came along and I thought, oh, I'll just stay at work for a while longer. And then I just actually recently quit my job in March and um, focused on the book and go from there. Yay. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So let's rewind. Yes. What year did this all start? So in North Carolina, you are required to be separated for 12 months. So it started in 2008. Yes, I know. That was an audible sigh that I hope my editors keep in because that is super annoying. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. So, you know, we had to wait the 12 months and then file. And once we filed, then it, then it went very quickly. Um, so it was 2008, 2009 okay. to go through that process. I can't think of a better time to have a divorce case. Going Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. And it was kind of crazy because, you know, the house is valued at one thing and then everything caves in and then right. it's not valued at that, but you're filing the divorce at that. And so, you know, that's how the math worked out, but it's fine. It worked out in the end anyway. Well, yes, it worked out in the end, but let's go back to the beginning. Yes. What was your financial position before the divorce? So um, when when we were, I guess, dating, um, we both worked. And so we never thought about, you know, like who thinks about saving money for retirement? You know, I mean, we had a 401k. We put very little in it. We were more going out to dinner and um, we both had family in Europe. So we would travel to Europe. Um, We would, you know, just live life. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, I made my paycheck and then, so I would spend like 90% of it and I paid all my bills. And then for, you know, their dad, it was more of a, I made my paycheck and I can spend more because I have this credit card and you just pay the minimum because isn't that what everybody does? And so there was, we never really had the money conversation. We never really talked about mindsets. And even after we got married, we still didn't have those conversations, even though there were clearly many opportunities where we should have, but we never, we never did that. And, and so that was just, you know, one more thing that we didn't, didn't, didn't agree on. It was a real problem with the budgeting word too, right? You had to uh, yes. figure out what we were bet- budget was going to be, but well, you weren't even ready to talk about it. What, for example, what was your debt? What, what was that made up? Of? So when I managed the bills, I paid everything off at the end of the month. When we got married, I said, you know what? I think you need to step up and take over. And he didn't really want to do that, but, you know, he did. And then about three months into it, um, you know, we got the credit card in the mail because that's what we used to get. Right. Um, and I opened it up and there were thousands of dollars of debt on there not paid. And I'm like, why, what, what is going on? And he's like, Oh, my paid the minimum. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's credit card debt. Everybody has credit card debt. And I was like, I, I need to take this back because this is not working for me. I do not want to live. I mean, it's bad enough. We don't have a lot of savings, but I don't want to have debt. And so I took it back. And then I was really excited because it took me like three, four months to pay it all off. And it was like, you know, maybe $6,000, you know, in a short period of time, that's a lot of money that wrecked up. So ended up paying it all off. I was super excited. And I went to him and I'm like, guess what? We have paid off all of our debt. And he was kind of like, oh, okay. Like it really wasn't, it didn't really matter him one way or the other. So oh. we really just had very different money mindsets, you know, but see, that would have been the perfect opportunity to have that conversation of what are we going to do moving forward? Right. But I never said that. He never said that. We never had that conversation. So I just continued to manage the money. And, you was, know. Was some of it at least mortgage debt or was it all so consumer debt? When we divorced, it was um, some mortgage debt was half mortgage. Okay. And then the rest of it was consumer. Um, and we bought a, um, a uh, what do you call it? A uh, townhouse. Okay. Because, you know. We live in North Carolina, so we're like, oh, everybody's going to want to come and visit, and they can stay at the townhouse, which is ridiculous. A, a because townhouse in addition to your primary residence. 3,000 square foot house where <laughs> it had a guest room and plenty of space. It was completely ridiculous. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and right. But she got that, and, you know, I ended up paying for it. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, what did you do with the money instead of paying off the credit card bills? Yes, that's a really wonderful question. Um, it, it, that's a really good question. It's it's hard to know where. I mean, he just kind of I went out to lunch with friends and bought stuff. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where oh look, this is this is really cool. I really really want it. I need that. It'll make me happy. And then you know you you buy it wow. thinking it's going to make you happy, and then two weeks later it's sitting there collecting dust because you're on to the next thing that's going to make you happy. Wow. And yeah, and that's, you know, that's where the money went. So I think it's safe to say you did not have the money conversation before you got married. Correct. Big mistake. Yeah. 
that's a big mistake. I think a lot of people make that mistake. Yes. We're not here to berate you for past mistakes. You can't go back and change them. If anybody's Cannot. got a time machine, please call me, email me, mediapickerpockets.com. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to give my phone number out, but email me, mediapickerpockets.com. <laughs> let me know because I have some uh, stocks I'd like to invest in back in 1982. Called, I'd, like, um, I'd like to reconsider Apple. some of my life decisions. Yes. yes. Yeah, for yes. sure. Oh my goodness, some life decisions I'd like to reconsider. But, you know, Having the money conversation is so important. Absolutely. I didn't have the money conversation with my husband, but I also used context clues. Like he used a coupon on our first date, which That's is awesome. so him. Like he's yeah. here too, because he's uh, in this space. Um, but did you and March have a conversation about money before you got married? Oh, we did. Doug's going to be perfect. The conversation yes. was, was March showing me how I needed to have a budget, how we needed to be able because I was that legendary college student that had money graduating from high school and managed to get rid of all of it by the end of my first year of college. Wait, so, I thought you walked on water when it came to money, Doug. I well, you me too. Before right. you walk what? on water, you got to hit rock bottom. <laughs> tell, I, uh, tell more. Yes, exactly. When you're, when you're in the Bahamas finishing your summer training as a midshipman in the Navy and they have an exit tax at the airport of $5 to get on a plane to go back home where you have to be, and, and you have to borrow that $5 from your best friend, that's when you know you've hit rock bottom. Oh, but I had wow. a wonderful time. And I know this because I can hardly remember any of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have Marge on the show. Does oh, yes. she do podcast interviews? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I now have a new goal. Uh -huh. Yes. But yes. this isn't the Doug show. This is the Monica show. Let's get back to Monica's story. Um, did you combine finances during your marriage or did you keep them separate? We combined okay. our finances. Yes. Do you think if you had kept them separate, that may have changed the outcome or were, was it? No. no, I don't think it would have okay. worked. And do you think the financial situation, like did the financial issues contribute to the divorce? The financial issues contributed. It wasn't the main thing, but it okay. contributed. Okay. Um, so how did you tackle this debt. You had $257,000 of random debt, including yeah. the mortgage on the unnecessary townhouse. Right. Well, that's all, it's all the, the townhouse, the, the mortgage and just random other credit card and other stuff um, that ne never mattered. Um, so it I never mattered. Yeah. I mean, so when I, <laughs> when I, when I had a job, um, I was trying to pay it down. And after about a few months of doing that and realizing that this is not going to work because it was like trying to pay down. It's like trying to shoot with a little water gun. And, you know, it's, it's just you're, you're trying to paint a whole, a whole wall with like a, like a little tiny paintbrush. It's, it isn't going to work. And so I took the debt, took the mortgage, and I, for right or, right or wrong, but I rolled it all together to make one big mortgage and did away with the home equity line of credit and took all of the debt, just rolled it all together. My thought was, first of all, I needed to get the house in my name only. Um, and so when I refinanced, um, that gave me the opportunity to take his name off the title. Oh, good move. And so it was worth it to me to do that. Um, and it gave me a big, you know, bigger mortgage payment, but I had no equity, um, no credit to be able to do anything so but that that does stretch the payments out over 30 it, years yes your, your home is at risk you're using your home equity yes. but you now have a lower payment and a much longer time yes and if you want to accelerate it you can pay off a minimum 30 year payment or you can accelerate yes. and pay it off short yes time. and it did give me that flexibility so it yeah. really was good when i was unemployed for five six seven eight months um to make ends meet, I was, um, you know, I dog sit, um, I cook for people. I sold since we had 3000 square foot house, I sold furniture out of the house. Um, I had to borrow money from my mom, which is a very, very humbling experience when you're in your forties. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you get very, very creative. Um, and then, so when after those first five years, I finally had an opportunity to, to sell the house and downsize, um, I had somebody finally make an offer on the house and that was a whole crazy situation because um, my real realtor was telling me that you should have men's clothes in the closet. And I said, oh 
why do I need to have meds? She goes, because if they see, they're going to, they're obviously, they're going to see children live here. They're going to see that there's only women's clothes in here. They're going to rake you over the coals and try to take advantage because they know you're in a vulnerable position. And I said, I mean, I'm like, who am I going to ask to say, can I borrow some of your clothes to put in my closet? I mean, so I, I did not take her advice. And sure enough, the one couple that came in to put an offer did rake me over the coals and nickel and dime me for every little thing. And I told my realtor, I'm like, I, I don't have the money to fix this laundry list of stuff. And she's like, you know what, let's fix this one thing that was like a, some dry rot on a window frame. I said, okay. And she goes, the rest of the stuff, it's honestly, it's just filler. They're just looking to squeeze you for They're everything. Just yeah. And then they had, they asked for a four week, closing because they had to sell a house that was um, out of state. And so they thought four weeks, they can get all their paperwork and everything. And I'm like, fine. So I did that. But then the four weeks came. And you've, my, you've seen this before, huh? Maybe? I, yes. yes. So, well, then you'll love the, you'll love the finale. So at the end of the four weeks, when we were supposed to go, supposed to go sign to sell the house, they, they had the nerve to call my realtor and say, we're missing one piece of paper. We need another week. You just move out of the house and we're going to move in and, um, and then we'll get you the money later. And I said, well, I said a couple of things I'm not going to say here, but <laughs> thank you. We're family friendly. Yes. We're we family still friendly, edit that out. <laughs> but yes, we can still edit that out. But, um, but yeah, so I said, absolutely not. My realtor was like, absolutely not. So I left my, my, all my worldly possessions in a truck at the, at the top of the driveway and slept in a, in a sleeping bag. And it turned out my kids were going to see their dad because it was the first week of summer. So he, they were going to be at their ha dad's house anyway. And then I just kind of stayed there with my two little cats and waited until paperwork cleared. And I mean, I couldn't move to my house because I couldn't get the keys because I didn't have the money to close on that house. Right. So I was like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Good. Yeah. Oh, but then in the middle of all that, this is, this is another thing. This is in the book actually. Um, is that during those four weeks while we were waiting and I was trying to sell stuff, my car broke down. And so I went to my, because of course, <laughs> of course, right. Murphy's law. And so I went to my mechanic who's, you know, really it's family run. And he sat me down and he said, it's a money pit. You have to get rid of it and buy another car. And I'm like, I, I literally have no money to buy a car. And he goes, if you put money into this car, you're, you're just throwing good money away. You, you really should get another car. So I got a, um, a used Honda Civic, which my daughter still drives today. Oh, yeah. Yes. And um, what was crazy about it was, so I was selling furniture out of the house, and I had big pieces of furniture. So I had, like, saved up $5,000 from selling all this crap out of the house. And the garage was like a gold mine. But anyway, um, so I <laughs> sold $5,000 of that. Turned out the car that I had, even though it wasn't very good, they could sell it for parts because it was discontinued. So I got $5,000 for that. And then I was able to pull a couple thousand out of my emergency money. And I got to the car for cash. So it's still my favorite car, even though it's, you know, it's, it's a 2003 Honda Civic, you know, but it's still my favorite car. These cars last a very long time. They do. They do. I currently drive a 2003 Honda Element. Oh, see? You know. So you understand. It, it goes it forever. Going. Yes. So this is your primary residence. What happened with the townhouse? Oh, um, um, he got that in the divorce. Okay. So he took that and the mortgage and all of the things associated with the townhouse. Yes. Okay. Well, Perfect. there was no mortgage because I, I had, that was part of the, um, the oh, debt. Oh, you got the mortgage on the townhouse and he got the townhouse? Yes. And, and it's still a bargain. In, in the long run, it's yes, a bargain. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because I am, I am so much further ahead. Right. Yes. Absolutely. But still. And I got the kids, which and to me is worth everything. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. My oh my God. I'm very fun. blessed. I've got wonderful babies, but I mean, they're not babies anymore, but you know. So you refi the house, you kind of roll everything into one great big 30 year mortgage. Yes. And you start your unemployment journey. Yes. I start this. Sorry. I'm not laughing. I sound like no. such a horrible person. No, like, no. Like, it's. What else could be thrown at you? Your car yes. breaks down. You get the mortgage on a house that you don't get to live in yeah. and all the debt. And, but you get the kids. I got the kids. And then you lose your job. And then after five years. Yeah. So how long did it take to pay off the debt? So, well, 
once I uh, sold the house, I was able to pay off all of the debt through selling the house. Okay. And put down 50% on my new little house. Oh. So I was able to open up a brand new home equity line of credit. Okay. And that home equity line of credit, I used to buy my first rental property. So what I did was I used it, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little, but I used that to um, buy, buy, it, buy my rental property for cash. And then I would turn around and um, go to the bank. And I had a pre-approved loan, which is very, very important. I want to say have, make sure all your paperwork is lined up, but I had a pre-approved loan. And so once I bought the house for cash, I turned around, went to the bank and then um, financed 80% of it, paid off the 20% and then got my taxes ready and waited until the next year to buy two more. How much was this house? The, the five houses that I ended up ultimately buying were anywhere from 56,000 to uh, 78,000 each. We, we don't see that in Hawaii. I, was I don't think say, you, you see that in Colorado. Yeah. In Hawaii, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same. We buy those all day long. In, in, so this uh, is yeah. invest where it makes sense to buy investment rental properties. Yeah. Yes. yes. Are I, these I, local to you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. These are, yeah, these are all local to me. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm so jealous that you have local to you properties. I mean, that's not the price they are now. This no, was no. 2015. Yeah. That yeah. you were buying this property. Yeah, it was uh, 13, 14, and 15. Okay. It was three years. So it was a very, very different market for sure. So the, the first property, mm -hmm. what did it need? You bought the house for cash for 56. So the first one I bought for 70, <laughs> say 79. 79. Yeah. And that needed nothing. And, wow. it, and it needed nothing. And, and it needed rent nothing. for like $12,000 a month, right? And, and <laughs> I, I was renting at like 850 a month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, that does is, make the 1% rule. That's the 1% yes. rule. Yes. Yes. Um, nice is, to see that happen to a rookie. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. I love it. Do yeah. you still own that property? I do. And it is under a mortgage or paid off? So I have, today I have three properties paid off and I, I own um, one consolidated mortgage on two. Okay. It's a, it's, it's a crazy story, right? It is I a mean, crazy story. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> you can make it up, but it's well. not as good as the <laughs> truth. Okay, so property two. You bought property number one. How long did it take to buy property number two? It was the next year. The next year. And yes. that was, how much was that? That one was probably like 72. Okay. And what did it rent for? Uh, they're, they're all around um, eight, 850 Okay. in the beginning. That's how they went. And how much did that, how much work did that one need? So then they started needing roof and HVAC, but not right away. And so, you know, we just do some like minimal stuff to get it ready to rent out. So like painting the inside and maybe if it needed carpet, we would do stuff like that. And then as the roof started to leak, then we would put in like five, $6,000 to replace the roof. And I had somebody manage the properties for me that, you know, helped walk me through the process of, you know, what it, what it takes to, and then, you know, like, so in those three years, they all at some point needed a new roof and a new um, HVAC. The property that I bought for like, I think it was like 56, 50, almost 52,000, but that needed the most work. And it came with a renter that was renting it for $800. So I'm a softie. I left her there, never really raised her rent because she's, you know, on her own and there were health issues. I don't know. I, so it was definitely renting below market value. But eventually, after three years, I had to evict her because she was a hoarding situation. It was, and there's a long story, but when she, when she left, it needed windows inside paint new carpeting new kitchen new new bathroom new outside there was a lot of glass and i you know we rent to families and so i had to make sure that all of that was you know cleaned up um so that one i mean honestly for the money i put into it i almost feel like we could have torn it down and built a brand new house right. it was practically there yeah i've bought that house yes yeah uh, how much did you put into that house? That house, I put in about $45,000. Oh. Yeah. That Do you was, still own it? Yeah, oh, yeah. And what is it worth now? Oh, now all of them are in like the 200000 220. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 100 in, 95 in, and you're at yeah. 200 value. That's yeah. a, a, a fair deal. Well, I think you're so. You're replacing things like roofs and air conditioning and heating. That's, that, yeah. that has a return on investment. 
I'm not talking granite counters or koi ponds. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, it's it's got a bit of a return on investment. It's yeah. but it's it's like you need a roof. And you need the air conditioning. You need the air conditioning. Yes. Well, depending on where it's at. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. need air conditioning. You need HVAC uh, or H heating um, H- in most places. You don't need a heater. Well, do you have a furnace in your house? No. Okay. No. This is one of the advantages of living in Hawaii. Is we do not have a furnace and we do not have air conditioning. So he doesn't have to pay $12,000 yes. every 30 years. You don't want to know what my electric bill is. <laughs> I know what your electric bill is. <laughs> okay. So you've bought your first house. You've bought your second house. Mm-hmm. And then uh, at, at, over two years. Yeah. At year three. So, yeah. So I had the first year... Um, I established the LLC to when I when I bought the properties, everything went under an LLC. So I only did the first house because that was all I was, you know, approved to buy with the bank. And so when I got my tax returns, um, I was lined up and ready to buy. So I bought two the second year. And yeah, yes, absolutely. And you know, it's funny because they're all like in the they're all like close to each other, and but they're all on the same three bedroom, one bathroom little hardwood floors, little carpet in the bedroom. You know, I mean, like, they're 1,000 square feet, more or less. Um, and they're perfect for for families. They're great for couples. I mean, it just, and it's close to downtown area, you know. Um, and then the third year, I actually bought the next two, number four and number five. I bought them within two weeks of each other, which was really crazy. One of them was a Section 8. It was my first time experiencing a Section 8, which... We ended up converting it. Wonderful people there. Wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And so it's, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's definitely, we could, we could do a whole show just on rental property adventures. Uh, you know, the good, the bad, you know, like some people they're like, Oh, you know, landlords can be so hard, but you know, it's, I think it's, it's, um, you know, everybody decides to run their business differently. I mean, you know, um, I think there's good landlords, there's bad landlords, there's good renters, there's bad renters, you know, I mean, like, it's just, it's just, um, but I like knowing that um, I've got families in there and, I'm, you know, helping to provide roof over their head and, you know. And, and they're taking care of the place. And they do. They do take care of the place. Yeah. With all this experience, did you invest in anything else? Was it strictly real estate? Did you put money in your retirement accounts? Yeah. What so, else, what other wealth building was there? So I, um, so it was 2008, you know, like everything, you know, like to everybody got 50% sure. discount on their retirement funds. Um, I didn't take the money out, even though a lot of my friends were like, no, no, take the money out. We don't know what's going to happen, but I left it there because there wasn't a lot there to begin with. So half of not a lot is, you know, may as well leave it. But when I had temp jobs, I always signed up for the 401k okay. and I put, I put, you know, it wasn't a lot, but I put a little money in there, even though there was no match, there was no, there wasn't anything to it. But so important is it was a lot of it was about building that muscle to discipline myself and okay. invest that. Yeah. And then the other thing was just learning how to budget. And I think, you know, when I tried budgeting in the past, my biggest takeaway, and I write about this in the book too, was not to go look at it backwards, reverse engineer. Don't just start putting numbers in and saying, okay, you have $400 to spend on groceries. Instead, and and when I coach people, I tell them, let's look at what you're spending today. Don't change your spending habits. The next four weeks, just record what you spend. And it's such an eye-opening experience. And then from that, you can make your budget, what you're spending. And then think about, is this... You no, know, is it worth it spending $500 going out to eat every month? Is that $500? Does it bring, do you remember where you ate? Did it bring you joy? And a lot of times people are like, I don't even remember why. I remember spending that money. Like, did I really spend $500, $600? Where did it out? all go? Where did it all go? Uh-huh. And so it's, it's having those conversations. You know, look at your spending. That's the conversation I always have. Is my spending matching what's important to me? Is, am I putting the money where I say, what, you know, like the words that come out of my mouth, the kids are, are important, family's important, friends. Am I spending my money that way? Is that, you know, and so it's it's having those conversations and taking that time. But everybody got to decide for themselves where the money was being wasted. Yes. Where they wanted to do something yeah. that was more valuable to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just really interesting conversations. You know, I mean, some people, I had one guy, he had three gym memberships who we were talking and. You know, and, and yeah, it's a lot of money for three gym members. So I was like, well, it's why? Why do you have, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, 
but really think about is that yeah well you know. <laughs> it's hard so, to get a pickleball court yeah you want it. i mean it was there were some interesting reasons for it but you know in the end he decided to to cancel too and take that money and it's just uh, you know it's just just really just thinking about it thinking about where your money's going and does it make sense for your life what's well, the first time too that it's not that you're being judged it's just the first yeah. time in a long time that you've had to reflect on yeah. that expense that you probably started on impulse a long time ago yeah. never really spent much attention to whether you use it or not mm-hmm. but now that you're looking at it as part of the big picture of the b word the budget yeah it becomes clear that you would really prefer to spend that other places yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely and it is it's very interesting conversations because you know what's important for one person yep. not necessarily the same for another you know yeah. Like, you know, Mindy, maybe you're not a three gym membership person, you know. How could you tell? But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, so it's like everybody's got their, got their thing that's, you know, they want to keep. Yes, everybody does have their thing they want to keep. And what does Paula Pant say? You can afford anything. You can't afford everything. Yes. I am a huge proponent of just tracking your spending when you first start out. Because, yeah, yep. you're absolutely right. If you put, oh, I'm going to spend $150 on groceries. If you mm-hmm. have no idea yeah. how much you're spending on groceries, yeah. $150 is going to cut it. Yeah. But if you have, unless you're Justin from Saving Sherpa. Unless you're growing most of your food <laughs> yeah. and using coupons on pizza, yes. Justin from Saving Sherpa has uh-huh. some like crazy, it's like $125 a month. But he shops the sales and he's like perfect and. Uh, he's a very interesting grocery store, mm-hmm. but everybody else on the planet doesn't spend $125. Yes, right? true. So you do have to see where your money's going. Yeah. And that alone is so eye-opening. It is. I've told the story multiple times on the show, but I started track. We we were like, why are we spending so much money? Mm-hmm. We don't do anything. We have mm-hmm. small children. Like, why is all this money leaving our wallets? Mm-hmm. Let's track our spending. So I started like, pen on paper writing it out and i was going to the grocery store literally every day for one thing but coming home with five or one thing and coming home with 15 and one thing and coming home with 27 and it's no big deal if you go to one thing and you come home with five right once a week or once a month but when you do it every day it adds up and i can see those other four things wow and once i i mean it was two weeks i was going to track it for a whole month but it was two weeks and i was like I see the problem. I see the hole in our spending. I'm going to the grocery store twice a month. Yeah. <laughs> I already said you were perfect, Doug. Thank you. Yes. I, I try to stretch it out. It, I don't like shopping. And that's the thing. I love grocery shopping. Me too. I love uh, cooking. Uh, I love eating. That's the yes. I love and eating. When I'm at the grocery store, oh, I I don't just go with the list. Or at the time, I didn't. Right. I could just wander up and down. I had two small kids. You got to eat up a day. Right, right. Going up and down the grocery aisles. Oh, look at this interesting thing. I'll try it. Yes. With no regard for what I'm going to do with it or the 37 other ingredients I need to make pickled pig's feet or whatever it was. Yeah. I was not making that. But yeah. like, <laughs> all the things you need to use this one, you know, bottle of giraffe's not or yeah. you know whatever oh, yeah. and what are you going to do with this stuff i had no plan but i would just randomly put things in my cart so once we started tracking it was very easy to cut down our expenses mm-hmm. because i didn't want to be spending 11 billion dollars on yeah. groceries it's that one thing track your expenses or i'm sorry not track your expenses track your spending yes in real time Yes. Yep. There are a lot of people, and I don't want to say that they're wrong. If Doug were to track his expenses at the end of the month retroactively, right. that's fine because he's got it dialed in. He's been doing this for a minute. Yes. But if you're just getting started, you don't track them at the end of the month Correct. backwards. You track them in real time because you can't remember. I mean, do you remember what you spent at Target last week? What it's, did you buy? Exactly. You don't remember all the little things. But when you're there, you're like, oh. It was $17 in this category and $14 in this category. And when you track it so hard, it's so helpful and eye-opening and you can make changes in the same month. Yes. When you have to look at those numbers and realize what you're spending it on in real time. Yes. And it only takes a minute a day, right? So it, it really does. It really does. If you're yeah. staying on top of it. And that's a really great segue, Doug, for me to have my confession. <laughs> I have been... I am not setting her up. You are not setting me up. However... 
I have been publicly tracking my spending for all of 2022. You can follow along at biggerpockets.com slash Mindy's budget until July. And we went all the way through June and did it great. And then in July, we kind of fell off the bandwagon and in August, we fell off the bandwagon. So now we have two months of expenses to go back and enter manually. Uh And I have to show you my spending tracker because it is really, really detailed because I want to know. I don't just track groceries. I track groceries and restaurants. I'm sorry, I don't track food. I track groceries. I track restaurants. I track parties. I have a pool in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I host a lot of parties. Mm -hmm. But if I lost my job and the stock market went to zero, I would have zero parties. That's an expense I could easily get rid of. So I track it. I'm trying to open it up, but boy, my computer is not. <laughs> this this FinCon routinely crashes all the bandwidth in the hotel. Oh my it's, goodness! It's, we, it's like we, a bunch of people. We need our own just, satellite. They just don't believe us when we, we tell do them. We do need our own satellite. Duck for president. Two thousand nerds go. together talking about money. That's a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> with a computer, with everybody with a computer, and yeah, they're just opening it up, and. Um, Everybody's opening up everything all at once. For real? Like, okay, my guys edit this out. <laughs> this is so awful. <laughs> it's supposed to just come right up. Come on. But this is populated by an app on my phone, a Google form that is on my phone. And I have it with me whenever I spend. I open it up. I type in the date, how much I spent, what I spent it on into the category, and where I spent it. And that is enough for me. I have pre-populated categories, and that's enough for me to know where I'm going. I really like the taste of alcohol. I go to tap rooms a lot. There's a lot of tap rooms in my city. But I also will, like, I have parties at my house, so I might go to the liquor store and buy some alcohol, too. Those are in different categories because liquor at, like, in bulk at at the liquor store is a different, like, it's not retail prices. I mean, it is, but it isn't. And then... Uh, do you see this? The red categories are where I go, um, where I went over in my spending. Uh, but every month I learn. Well, I don't learn. <laughs> you learn you don't like to look at red. <laughs> I don't like to look at red. Not that you can tell as I miss in every single month in sure. my grocery bag budget. But it's it's a learning experience. And I know, hey, I'd love to spend $400 a month on groceries. Not going to happen. Yeah. So if it's not going to happen... I need to adjust my budget. Yes. And if if that has to go up, something else has to come down. Where can I cut? Oh, alcohol is real easy to cut. Tap rooms, super easy to cut. Yes. I can have people over at my house. It's like $7 a beer to go to the tap room. It's like $14 a six pack to go to the grocery store and buy it and bring it over to my house. That's cheaper. Let's everybody come over to my house yes. and have a big party. But it's not just that. You've learned that beer is an essential part of your life and you're only going to negotiate how much you spend for it, not whether you're going to have it at all. Exactly. And you're willing to work for that expense. It has value and it brings that value to your life. You're willing to work to it's buy those groceries. <laughs> no, but you know, I Whereas mean, it's, clothing, I mean, my clothing budget's like a hundred dollars. Yes. Cause and, I yep, do not care. Yep. I see. And that's, that's, that's how I am because I'm a big foodie too. I mean, unfortunately not all food loves me, but I love all food. <laughs> You know, but I mean, that's, that's where I spend my money. And to your point about, you know, going to the grocery store, like, Ooh, I don't know what this is, but this looks really cool. I want to try what this is. And sadly, my daughter is the same way. She loves trying, trying food. And so what I, what I learned though, is that if I find myself getting a little, you know, out of, out of hand with the, the food budget, we have this thing where I'm like, I'm not going to the grocery store for another week and week or two weeks. We have to shop inside whatever's in the pantry in the fridge. We have to get creative now. And that forces us to like really whittle it down the freezer and just kind of, so it, it gets a little creative toward the, the end of those two weeks. But, um, but it's, it's a good way to kind of remember like, well, listen, we bought this. Let's before it expires, let's, let's eat that. Let's not, you know, but that's valuable to you. You're willing to yes. spend that life energy for that money yes. to buy that thing that brings mm-hmm. you so much pleasure. Yes. So you're going to find a way to afford that, whether, whether you have to cut the spending, a bunch of other categories or whether you're going to go out and work extra hours or find a way to get promotions and True. salary boosts. True. But I mean, I'm not a clothes person, you know, I, I, 
I don't, don't look at me. Yeah. yeah I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I don't drink a lot. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not big on my hair. I mean, like, I'm just, I'm, you know, a lot of things that, but food to me, is like, food's like, you know, it's like you say, you know, it's like, that's your time that people come together, you, you know, and it's, it's very social and it's the experience that goes with it. Experience. And to me, yes. And to me, that is, that's everything. That's everything. Okay. So <laughs> that was a fun little detour. Yes. Let's get back. <laughs> Let's get back on track. Um, after you had five properties, what was it? When when did it click that you were financially? So, I it's, it's when it actually was after you know I was buying the properties. After that, that I started to learn about the fire movement. It was you know toward the tail end of that journey, and. It, it started to click when I started to read about it. And I understood that, you know, you don't have to wait until you're in your sixties or seventies to retire. You could, you could do it sooner. And so then it became kind of a game to see, well, you know, where am I with this? And what does that look like? And how do I, you know, have income stream to know that I can be financially independent. And so um, I, when I looked at the properties, so they were all fixer uppers. And so I decided that when the big things were done, like the last one I did was that, you know, 45 some odd thousand dollars to, to get that one fixer upper done. That was the last one I did. Um, so I knew that when I had all of those done, I thought, okay, I'm, I can, I can be ready to, to quit. And then I finished them and I thought, I'm I'm not, I'm not ready. And so I kind of fell into that trap of, um, you know, it's like, like Doug would say, and Jay Money would both say, you know, like, don't, don't be the, you know, don't wait three, four, five, six years saying, oh, next year, next year. I'm just, gonna, just, just one more year, just one yeah. more year. Yes. And I was starting to do that, that just one more year. Um, but I mean, you know, COVID came along and I think that for me, it, it, it wasn't the money, but it was the realization that, that, that journey, that 10 years, that was just step one. And that I, I, I spent so much time trying to figure out um, how was I going to replace that paycheck that I, I never, you know, thought about what was I going to do after. And so that took a little bit of time. You know, um, my mom was, was got sick and she ended up passing and that took a little bit of a toll. And I, so for me, it was just a little bit of uh, just trying to, you know, take, take a breath and take a step back and figure out where do I go from here. And um, at and this that, point, though, you had plenty of cash flow from the rental properties, yeah. and it's probably going up with market rents and keeping up. And you're not feeling like you're losing out with tenants or expenses. Correct. And you also had been investing in your 401k or retirement accounts, yes. so you could put together a plan mm -hmm. for financial dependence, knowing that you might earn another dollar or two in your life after reaching financial mm -hmm. dependence. Yes, absolutely. But I mean, I knew that I could, whether I earned a dollar or two or not, that, you know, my expenses are covered every month. Good. Okay. I would still take a vacation or two and, you know, and everything was going to be fine. It, it all fits. Yeah, it all, it all fits, you know, but that didn't, still didn't get me to. That just quitting. one more year is the most powerful influence yes. in personal finance and it keeps you from making the leap. But yes. on the other hand, now that you've made the leap, you're not laying awake at night wondering if you've overlooked some horrible mistake or some incredible expense that you didn't Correct. see coming. Correct. Correct. You've got margin. Yes. You've got resilience. I, and I did. Yeah. Resilience. Yes. And oh, yeah. resilience. Yeah. Absolutely. And <laughs> and it's funny because you know, like, so when I quit, I think it was the first four weeks that I thought, what did I do? I need to go find a job because it was a bit surreal. But now I'm like, best decision ever best decision ever. Um, I, I love not having my nine to five. I mean, I loved my teams and what I did, but I, I love this more. I, 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 I should point out at this point that once she was no longer going to work, she was trying to replicate that pace and the deadline pressure <laughs> and everything else about her old okay. life in her new life. <laughs> and somebody had to step in and suggest that maybe she should slow down a little bit, space it out. It's okay to take a break. Yes. How I'm, did you convince her? Because so, I'm married to her. So, yes. no, I yes. believe I believe the words were, you don't have to uh, do everything in the first three months of, of quitting your day job. And... But it's, you know, you're so ingrained in 
the, the long hours and the working and the drive that it doesn't turn off because you quit your job on a Friday and Monday comes around and you're kind of like, I, and I still, I, I literally Monday went downstairs, same time I always do, get up at six. I was on my you know laptop by 7 a.m. I had my coffee, you know, and I was like looking at emails and thinking about, okay, so what am I going to do today? And, you know, I worked on the book. That was a big thing. That's what writes the book. Is yes. That daily habit. The that's daily right. habit. Yeah. And, you know, so, you, you know, I'm still in that. So that's like, that's a work in progress. That's definitely, because it's only been, you know, it's, I'd only been like six months. So. Only. only. Yes. Yeah. It, it is a work in progress. Um, yes. It's only been five years for my husband yeah. and he's still bangs it out every day because yeah. it's now it's his, he says it's his time. So he can't afford to waste it. I'm like, you know, it's okay to enjoy doing nothing. It's okay to not be productive. It's okay to sit there and read a book that you enjoy and that doesn't teach you something. It's totally okay. And then he's like, oh, okay, I'll read Stephen King's it in bed. I'm like really the one book that I had to put down and never, ever, ever pick up again. That's the book you choose to read. I, I, I share your concerns. Face down. Yes. <laughs> face down. Don't ever leave that book face up in the bedroom. Okay. Sorry. Um, in terms of your rental property income, how does that compare to what your W-2 was bringing in? So the rental property income, it's, it covers not everything. Um, but it, but it covers like just over half of my of my monthly expenses. Okay. Um, and then I have this uh, is this is the net rental income after you've paid all the yes. expenses of maintaining and repairing right. the property, and now you've got the and actual mortgage yeah. cash flow to work with. Yeah. And so, okay, yeah. over and half so, of your living expenses. Yeah, it's okay. just over half. Okay. Um, and then I, I have some, you know, my uh, just you know in a savings account. I have cash there. Um, and, and you're then, drawing down your assets, perhaps, maybe not at a rate that's going to bankrupt you in five years, but you're using a 4% safe withdrawal rate or something else that makes you comfortable. To yeah, figure I, think, out. I think right now it's a little less because the rental is doing well. Right. And right. so I you've don't need to. You've got cash flow, you've got annuity income for property, right. property, so you yeah. can afford to have a much more sustainable withdrawal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So do you have plans for more rental properties? You know, I. I, I do and I don't, I don't know, not really. I mean, there are a couple of things I was looking at, like syndication that looks really interesting. Um, oh, yeah. So I've been having some of those conversations, but nothing, nothing concrete. I think right now I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, just the book and um, sharing my story and helping other single parents out there uh, know that it's, it's hard when you've got little kids and you're on your own, but I, I really, you know, I, I wish I had a book. I wish I had, you know, people to lean on. And then that's, that's really my focus right now is, is uh, serving and giving back. She's been to two financial conferences since she stopped showing up for work. And, and despite the idea well, I, that she's surrounded by real estate investors, she is held firm. She has not bought anything yet. Actually, my third one. This is the third one. Yes, because no money, no money was the first one. Okay. <laughs> yes. And then it was Camp Fi. That's and right. then... And yep. then I came to FinCon, okay. but it's my last one for the year. Stay but strong. I've already signed up for another one in March. But okay. Yeah. But I love it. I love it. It's wonderful. Okay, so what is next for you besides a whole year's full of uh, Camp Fi's and <laughs> financial conferences? I recommend Camp Fi. It's wonderful. But I yes, mean, these is. are. I love it. Yeah. No, it is. It's a lot of fun. Um. So what's next? So I, I, yeah, I started blogging on the piece of the pie, but I put that on hold to write the book. It's now that the book is out. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of the year. I hired somebody to help me uh, rebrand because I learned that uh, WordPress is not my forte uh, and I'm better at giving the content and not good at making it look pretty. So um, I'll be rebranding that. Um, I'm looking to build a community with the blog. So it'll be blog um, directions on how you can build your slice of you know, how you can grab your slice and make your own five pie. And then the third section, I want it to be um, for community where other uh, financial coaches can come and showcase some of their case studies and people that they've worked with. And yeah. And so that uh, when, when people come to the site, they can go, Oh, I relate to this story and Oh, look, um, you know, Tina, uh, who is the financial coach, that's her. She, she gets me. 
she and so I can call Tina and I want to build that community on the site. And so that's something that the rebranding that will be part of this year. The site will be ready. I think January is a fair timeline. Um, and then I also am going to turn my my book into an audio book, which will be ready probably February time. And then after that, I think people learn differently. And so I want to do a workbook and online classes um, so that, you know, if you can read the book and follow the directions there and hear my story, or you can have your own workbook and make your own uh, five pie and, or have online classes. So yeah, I that's like the near books. future. I yeah. don't think there's enough workbooks out there. I think there's books and then they don't really give you like some people, you're right. They, they learn differently and mm-hmm. they go in and you like actually write it out and see it and you see the steps. And, oh, that makes sense in yes. a way that reading it maybe didn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really loved the workbook that we did for uh, First to a Million, where we teach kids about money uh, by Dan Sheeks. He did a workbook. Yes. I actually, I like the workbook almost more than the book itself. It's, mm-hmm. it's just so helpful to kids who are already filling out stuff at school all the time. It's yes. Just, it's such a natural progression. I yeah. love it. Okay. Well, tell people, Monica, where they can find out more about you. So I have a site called grabyourslice.com and you can hear more about, you know, about me, the author. Um, you can see where you can buy the book, which is anywhere books are sold. And yeah, and then just follow along because there's a link back to the blog of the piece of the pie and you'll see the progression and the rebranding and where we go. It'll be an exciting, 2023 is going to be very exciting. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I've had a few other projects that I've got once I get past this, that are very whoa, exciting. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're retired. Yeah, no, You're I know. <laughs> she has projects. They just don't your... have deadlines <laughs> yeah. yet. So, I have to meet your husband because I'm like, oh, it's like my brother. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> okay, well, he's just down the road. So we'll go as soon as we wrap this up. I'll go cool. introduce you to <laughs> Okay, well, huge thanks to the National Endowment for Financial Education for sponsoring the podcasting booth at FinCon 22 in um, kind of stormy Orlando, Florida. I'm surprised we haven't been interrupted by thunder and lightning. Yeah, yet, right? well, there was some thunder earlier today. Uh-huh. But yeah, I'm glad the power stayed on the whole time uh-huh. we were recording. Uh, from episode 345 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is the military guide. Doug Nordman from militaryfinancialindependence.com. Doug, tell us what's going on over there. I'm updating the original version of the Military Guide, which is now 11 years old. Uh, The book is largely evergreen. There's a few things that the military has changed in personal finances over the last decade that I'll update. Once that's done, I'll start working on my third book. And this will be about living your financial independence. Mm -hmm. And I've been beta testing some of the concepts on some of the people that I've come in contact with. I love it. I love it. Okay, Doug, thank you so much for stepping into Scott's shoes today while he gallivants around. And I'm not his... going to make a joke about tough shoes to fill, but I will say <laughs> that I'm happy to show up whenever you need help. <laughs> like the military always does. There you go. We, we like that, that stepping in and taking care of things. <laughs> okay, so he is Doug Nordman, and I am Mindy Jensen saying chop, chop, lollipop. Oh.